Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cent segment. I'm your host, Pete Wargent, and I'm joined by, as usual, Chris Bates. Chris, how's it going? Mate, life's good here. Um, flying out to Fiji in under 24 hours, so um, in holiday mood already. Um, but um, yeah, things have been good. How you been? Good. So you're just going to rip through a podcast and then get on a plane. Lucky you. Um, <laughs> and uh, what's been happening over in the UK? You've been over in Wales, you said? I have been in Wales for the last four or five days, just catching up uh, with my brother. He's getting married in the US next year, so I figured I'd better... Uh, catch up with him and uh, it's a beautiful part of the world over there. I haven't been since I was a kid actually, so uh, not properly. Uh, so yeah, interesting um, to visit and see what the differences around some of these uh, cities around the world. I think uh, Cardiff, like a lot of um, British cities, is kind of being reborn on international students and universities. Uh, the old sort of coal and slate industries in Wales have sort of drifted away over the years. So yeah, it's interesting to see some of the parallels that you see a lot of these cities around the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, I guess if you've got a plane to catch, let's crack on uh, with this week's episodes. Every morning at 7 a.m., you'll find our Two Cents podcast episode waiting for you in your podcast player. And we like to talk about the big three property news stories of the week. So this week, uh, number one story was inflation. Now, we didn't cover it last week, Chris, uh, because we were recording literally two hours before the inflation figures were out. So we're going to do a bit more of a deep dive on the easing inflation figures and what that means for the housing market. Secondly, Chinese developers exiting Australia in droves. There's almost none of them left now. Interesting story in the Fin Review this week with Larry Schlesinger. And thirdly, uh, Canada's property market still booming despite higher mortgage rates and higher interest rates. So we're going to take a look at what's happening in Canada and why, and then look at some of the parallels with what's happening here in Australia, with particularly with regards to the higher mortgage rates, record high immigration, and so on. So, Chris, let's start with the inflation figures that we kind of missed last week uh, due to the timing. So, at the headline level, inflation, well, it was actually better than expected. It fell to 0.8%. I was actually watching the Aussie dollar. I uh, like to try and get a, an early read on what's happening, and the dollar dropped about 0.7% immediately. So, as soon as I saw that downward spike on the chart. I knew that the inflation figures were softer than the market expected. Uh, what did you take away from those inflation figures, Chris? Look, I think it's been a bit of a mugs game trying to predict interest rates over the last you know, 12, 18 months. And I think inflation figures are very similar, right? I think um, ultimately, though, they're heading in the right direction. And I think there's countries around the world that have definitely got it into the 2 3% band that ultimately we, we're trying to aim for. I mean, I guess there's still, you know, some people have been celebrating that the genie's back in the bottle and, um, you know, the good times are coming back and, uh, you know, we're going to see rate cuts, you know, in the near future. Other people are saying even though it's coming down, it's still quite sticky, right? It's, you know, we're going to have to have high rates all the way through to 2024, 2025. And so I think that's the real um, story here is, you know, yeah, it's going in the right direction, uh, but how long is it going to take and how high do we have to keep rates up? Um for how long um, to get it back into that two to three percent band? Now, if it goes down in, you know, the next sometime in 2024, I don't think there's going to be a big issue. To be honest, I think um, you know borrowers will see that inflation keeps going down. The uh, story will change at the RBA. Um, there'll be this like, uh, you know, definitely some debt stress. We're definitely seeing a lot of clients come to us and are worried about repayments and and are trying to. Um, get through this um, uncertainty. This, this get a build a bridge basically to the other side. I mean, that was a lot of the terminology in COVID. It's kind of like what people are doing with their personal finances. And so, if we do see that this continues to go down, like Canada and US and other countries that we're seeing, um, I think that's going to. I think borrowers are going to be fine. You're not going to see this massive, you know, uh, listings um, hitting the market. I also think that that 
if that sto- as soon as that story turns really positive, which I don't think it is yet, um, and you know people do really believe that inflation's um, you know heading in the right direction significantly, that will very quickly get factored into prices because buyers will automatically will will price property like rate cuts are a certainty. Um, and so buyers won't wait for rate cuts till they start making decisions. We're already starting to see that personally. I can see through inquiry. We've had two massive weeks. Um, our settlement numbers have been up dramatically the last two or three months. Um, so I think that's the story for me, Pete. I think it's heading in the right direction. I'm not going to call it and say the inflation challenge is over because it's only over when we get it back in that 2 to 3% band um, or we've got a really clear path that we're going to get there soon. So um, what's your take, Pete? I agree. If you look at the component parts of inflation, because I guess this is one of the weird things with inflation, we always sort of pick this number 0.8%. But within that, you've got some uh, prices going up, you've got others going down. And it's actually, when you dig into it, it's much more complex than people uh, give credit for. I think if you look at uh, what bond markets uh, were pricing, well, the terminal rate came down quite significantly after the figures came out. I mean, my reading of it, I mean, looking at it, there are some prices that are coming down already. I think uh, there were also retail figures out um, over the past week and uh, retail turnover fell 0.8%. And uh, if you look at things like department stores, big drop, 5% drop over the month. And later on this week, we'll actually get the retail volumes figures. So not just turnover, but the actual volume of uh, retail goods uh, being sold. And that should be down probably about 0.5% for the quarter. So uh, despite the big population growth in Australia, I think we'll start to see the price of goods coming down. This is normally what happens. Retail, uh, well, the sector is looking to be in a bit of trouble, to be honest, and that will probably result in some discounting. As you said, though, I think the um, the real source of inflation going forward is going to be in the services part of the economy. Um, I guess the risks would be in things like energy, uh, oil prices have started going back up a bit again, so that could feed through to fuel prices and so on. We already know things like insurance have just been painful, uh, about 14% higher over the past year and some of the other services prices. One interesting thing I've noticed, Chris, just in the past few weeks is that the rents uh, seem to have cooled right off. And I, I, maybe there's a seasonal thing happening here in Sydney in particular, um, and a lot of people are overseas. So maybe that could come back, but that does seem to have come right down. Um, so as you said, uh, it's a bit of a fool's errand trying to predict these things. And certainly 0.8 was a whole lot better than the 1.1 markets were expecting. And um, the trimmed mean inflation figure, which strips out some of the volatility, was also under 1%. So we're pretty close I guess, on the quarter to getting back to the band, but uh, not quite out of the woods yet. And that's why markets are just uh, toying with the idea of a bit more tightening, I guess. Yeah, I think the um, ex-governor of the RBA, um, you know, said that if people are worried about their rents, uh, they're going to move back in at home. They're going to flat share. They're they're going to, you know, there's a limit on what people can pay in rents. And I actually think that's starting to to flow through. I think people have got a, a pressure that can only afford 300 or 400 a week or whatever it might be, um, and they have to start making changes. They have to move further out. They have to flat share. They And so I think that's going to potentially slow down rental growth, but it doesn't mean there's not a rental crisis. I still think it's really hard for people to rent, and there's still an attack on investors. I think that's the... The canary in the coal mine, I think, for the rental crisis is we are absolutely seeing um, multi-portfolio investors really get challenged and are really considering, you know, whether holding assets is the right decision because, you know, there's a whole, like, thought process, which I don't believe in for a lot of property investors, is that, oh, it's covering itself. It's washing its own face. There's, you know, this sort of, there's these, like, um, sayings in the property world. Well, I'm not going to sell it. It's sort of covering its own expenses. It's almost paying itself off. That's usually not the case, to be honest. And I think a lot of investors are saying, well, no, it's not covering itself. You know, with eight rates at 6 to 7%, even though rents have gone up, I'm actually still having to pay cash flow for this. And that's not what a lot of investors signed up for. They, they wanted something that wasn't going to cost them money, plus their mortgage is costing them money. Then potentially they look at the growth and say, well, you know, after capital gains tax, after all my costs, after my maintenance, after I had to fix that roof, um, have I really making that much money? Let's just get out. And um, you know, we had a client, I think last week we had over 10 properties our clients are thinking about selling, right? Uh, and so if the, I don't think we had 10 new investors, right? So if you think about this, I think you've got 3 million investment properties. If 5 or 10% of them want to sell, 
that's a lot of people trying to exit the um, rental market. And I don't think you've got that many investors entering. So you could easily see the dynamics um, shift even further. So the rents are a big story to watch. We're recording this on Monday morning. Um, given I said earlier on that I'm flying to Fiji tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, Priorities, um, Chris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we thought we'd want to get this out. Um, obviously, the inflation figures are going to uh, the uh, RBA decision is going to have been uh, done earlier this week. You're hearing this on Sunday. Um, I mean, I we don't really. I've seen that story flip so many times over the last eighteen months. I'm not game to try to predict what's going to happen. Um, but I think we're getting close to the top, Pete. Right? That's that's obviously the story, and I'm, I'm going to be very surprised if on Tuesday that the story is very hawkish, and you know that the rates are going to continue to go up. What's your sort of take on it? Yeah, I think if you look at where markets are pricing, what's been happening in currency markets, bond markets, it does seem to be shifting in that direction anyway, lower terminal rate. Um, but you know, things can change, and they've changed before. I think on the rental story, the real petri dish. Is Melbourne. I think um, PropTrack's figures showed uh, rental listings for Melbourne down 22.7% over the past year. So that's the biggest drop of any capital city. But now we've got uh, a number of changes that are flowing through to the Victorian rental market. There's changes uh, proposed for land tax. Uh, we've had all of these issues related to tenancy rights. Um, there's also there's some other supply related issues, things like the logging exit from that industry so you know there's going to be uh, some cost implications there um and um yeah there's just so it seems to be one thing after another uh, with victoria's uh, changes to the rules and regulations which never inspires confidence in investors and um yeah potentially more investors may look into state so i guess that's really the one to watch is melbourne uh, probably the city with the biggest population growth projections as well over the next decade, um, maybe uh, Brisbane as well. There's still some pressures there, but possibly some signs of easing elsewhere. So, yeah, let's uh, watch this space. Um, but certainly it was good to finally get some good news on inflation because it's mostly been bad over the past uh, 15 months or so. Um, so, Chris, let's have a flick onto this second story. So interesting story from a, our old friend Larry Schlesinger at the Finn. Um, so Chinese developers exiting Australia in droves. So I guess in terms of what is happening, uh, so the story reported, Country Garden has joined the retreat of debt-laden Chinese developers retreating from the Aussie housing market, uh, pulling uh, the plug on one of its last remaining projects, a giant estate in Melbourne's west, uh, putting it on the market. Now, there's a number of other Chinese developers have already gone, uh, Poly, Greenland, Yuhu, uh, Daily and Wanda. So I guess there's basically none of them left now. Uh, so Chris, my reading of this, I guess there's two different things going on here. Firstly, there's the construction cost pressures that is impacting all of the developers in Australia. So that's uh, kind of a an overarching point. But also, uh, there's a real issues uh, happening in China's housing market. Um, the biggest um, story, I guess, was the Evergrande uh, sort of uh, behemoth and uh, they really delayed their reporting of their accounts, an $81 billion loss over two years. I mean, I, I've never really heard of such big losses in any uh, sort of business or sector that I can remember. Um, so that um, has seen uh, the suspension of shares being traded. Uh, creditors are sort of pouring over what remains of the assets, trying to get money back. That's an absolute mess, but I guess um, there's sort of debt-laden pressures all across Chinese property developers and uh, riskier projects overseas in places like Australia are being, uh, well, they're seeing the, the plug getting pulled now. So there's there's just not the same investment that we were getting uh, six or seven years ago from China, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's a bit, I haven't really thought about this too much um, into the impact on our development world of how much uh, Chinese developers are playing. Um, look, I haven't got the stats on, you know, what percentage of apartments are built by Chinese construction companies, you know, um, you know, where are the workers sort of coming from? Are they, you know, uh, people who live here? Are they people who are getting, um, you know, also uh, moving here, I guess. But I think it's a really interesting story. I think, you know, Polly just did an amazing um, tower in the city. Aqua did an amazing apartment block in the city. This Greenland estate in Erskineville, that block of land is huge. It's, uh, that just got resold. That was a lot of apartments that they were going to build. Um, you know, there's obviously a house and land package, that one that they've just sold. So, 
you know, these are, are basically money that was going to flow into the country that was going to also, um, you know, help us build more housing, whether that's for people to buy or whether that's for people to to move into and rent um, and sell to investors, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think that's a lot of um, lost money coming into the country that was, you know, there's a multiplier effect on that. And I just wonder, we've already got potentially, I was talking to a construction company here um, last week that I do a lot of work with, you know, one of the execs here, a different one that I've mentioned on um, a different podcast. Um, and all that contingency money, that plan B money that was, you know, that the, um, Construction companies had there in case they had issues, but they had issues with weather, they had issues with getting labour, they had issues with material pricing, had um, fixed price contracts, you had ridiculous competition and very low margins coming into it. Um, and so the, a lot of that contingency money got burnt on a few bad jobs. Um, and now they're at a case of, um, you know, less likely that banks are going to lend to them to do new jobs because they've got less buffers. Um and so I think that's a real worry for the construction industry. But um, that was my take on it. I just wasn't sure exactly how much of an um, impact they were making. But ultimately, I think that was a lot of money and um, a lot of support they were providing to the construction industry that's going to be struggling right now coming out of the last few years. So the only uh, Chinese developer that will still be actively developing projects in Australia will be Aqualand uh, down at Central Barangaroo. I think um, so. Larry drew some parallels here with the retreat of Japanese developers, famously in the late 1980s. So um, in Australia, if you, if you ever go to the Gold Coast, you can sort of see the remnants of the Japanese investment, the golf courses, and some of the big uh, developments and hotels and so on. But then uh, the Japanese asset bubble crashed, and that was the end of that uh, for. Uh, Japanese investments in Australia. Now, um, I guess it's a, a different cycle in some ways. And um, yeah, we were definitely seeing um, there was a lot of Chinese investment in commercial assets, in farms. Uh, mm. And yes, there was certainly there was some upwards pressure on things like um, some of those development sites. I can remember in Erskineville, hundreds of millions of dollars being paid for development sites, but we're not seeing the supply come through. I think the other thing that's going on in the market more generally and it would take way too long to list all the recent insolvencies in the building and development sectors um but uh, i saw even just today the um there's a proposed uh, project that was approved back in 2020 a 450 million dollar uh, development at uh, Tawong village in brisbane uh, the whole uh, project has been scrapped um so mm. now that was um probably only a couple of hundred apartments and the rest was going to be commercial and office space uh, but it sort of um, really just signifies some of the challenges that are going on right now. It's just very hard. Margins are very thin. Uh, materials prices have, have spiked higher. Uh, still capacity constraint issues in terms of labor. And um, yeah, we're just seeing this uh, ripple out right across the sector. And um, so many projects just not being brought to market. They're being mothballed or scrapped. Um, so it's kind of adding to this... Um, the supply issues in the housing market. And um, yeah, see, as you said, I hadn't really thought too much about the Chinese developers exiting either until I saw the article in the AFR. But um, yes, it does just seems to represent what's going on more broadly at the moment. Yeah, I think the um, two things that the Evergrande lost, I think Evergrande or whatever, um, can't remember, how do you say it? Nobody but, can pronounce it, Evergrande. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll just, uh, let's just think of what I were talking about. An 80 odd billion dollar loss. When I was working in the UK uh, back in 2008, RBS, which I was working at, had the biggest loss in UK history. And I think it was 26 billion pounds, um, which was a lot of money that went on to the, the government. Um, basically, the government took it over for cents on the dollar, on cents on the pound. But um, that was a huge, huge loss. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's going to have set. And the other thing I think with China's money is, look, I don't know if, if someone's listening to this and they really understand. The Chinese tax laws. Let me know, but um, I did hear last week that you know if, if you own a property um, in China, and I'm not sure if this is right, that in you die, that money goes back to the Chinese government. You can't pass it on to your kids, um, and so that's one of the reasons I I think if that's true, I'm not sure. I'm not not necessarily know it's true, but I think that's why a lot of Chinese do get their money out of China is they know that if it's in their house, it's in the you know, their wealth in China, then they haven't got control of it. It can go back to the government rather than passing it down to their kids. And so 
Hence why they, when they're looking to just get the money out, price doesn't matter as much. It's really about just getting it out of the country. And the rules around transferring it out of China um, obviously be very publicised and sometimes it's a bit easier than it's and sometimes it's a bit harder. And so, um, yeah, if, if anyone knows that rule, let us know. So what's our third story, Pete? I think it um, times quite nicely into the second story. Actually, on that point, Chris, just before we wrap up on the Chinese developer story, a whole raft of articles over the past week, um, including surveys from Jawai and elsewhere, showing that um, Chinese investors have, um, well, uh, essentially billions of dollars ready to pump into housing markets overseas. And Australia came in number one on that list. Now, uh, these articles always get people hot under the collar. And I think um, people sort of cite these uh, auction uh, houses in Australia where there's a lot of um, buyers often of Chinese heritage and there's a lot of sort of grey areas there about you know who's a citizen and who isn't and how does the money get wired into Australia and all the all of those pathways uh, but um, yeah certainly um, after a long lull uh, through COVID uh, there's a lot of articles doing the rounds this week about Chinese investment so I think that's um, just a story that will start to uh, sort of rise up again. I mean, it generally does anyway when property prices start rising, people start looking for reasons and uh, non-resident buyers are always uh, getting a finger prodded in their direction. But um, yeah, it was just noticeable. There's been a lot a lot of reporting in that direction. Um, so yes, third story of the week, Chris. So um, another AFR article actually, Canada property market booming despite higher interest rates. So what's happening? Um, well, I guess the the basic thrust of the article was uh, the Bank of Canada eventually paused its campaign of interest rate hikes earlier this year, uh, even though the Bank of Canada is warning that interest rates could go higher still. A lot of people have just, um, well, they've heard all of these stories over years and years about when the bubble bursts and how, how to survive the crash and all of this kind of stuff, which has just never happened. And uh, a few home buyers were sort of quoted saying, well, look, interest rates are going to come back down. You can never go wrong with real estate. And it's almost like a game of chicken going on here. Uh, buyers are just going to keep on going. And um, yes, there's some sort of change of approach between variable and fixed rate mortgage, uh, mortgages, but people are just going to keep on buying by the looks of it. Um, now, I suppose if you look at the reason for that, well, I guess the, um, the, the main conclusion seems to be it's not just about interest rates. It's about supply and demand and there's record high or world-leading immigration program in Canada. So there's quite a few parallels here, Chris, with what's happening in Australia, not least the um, supply-demand imbalance and record high immigration. And we're, we're also grappling with higher mortgage rates. So it's a pretty interesting article to read. Yeah, I think my uh, you know, when I flicked it through to you, Pete, I was sort of thinking Australians can get very much um, stuck in our own little island, right in our own little bubble. But a lot of the issues that we're grappling in Australia, other countries around the world are grappling with, right? And, you know, property booms have happened all over the world. You can, and um, there's, you know, there's issues around property and property prices um, in lots of countries around the world. And so we can sometimes feel isolated and think that what we're dealing with here is not what other people are dealing across the world. And in Canada, I think so. What I love about this article per se is it really talks about the psychology of the market reacting differently to what you know conventional thinking would be and conventional thinking interest rates are going up they're at all-time highs well you're going to see a property crash people are going to adjust their expectations people are going to be forced to sell but that just is not the what happens right people then take make bets on where rates are going to be longer term i think in canada they're saying hey yeah i know rates are high but you're not going to be able to keep them there you know you're going to have to cut them and why would i wait for when you're cutting rates for prices um, because when you do that, prices are going to go back up. So I need to get ahead of the curve and I need to start buying now. And I think this is exactly what we've seen in Australia. Um, you know, people have got that resilience, that's overconfidence, I would say, with the property market. That article also highlights that, you know, you can never lose in real estate. It's the best investment asset class. There was all these like similar sort of things that people stay in Australia. And um, I think as Canada is, a, you know, got similar migration, um, similar desirability, a lot of affluence, go, you know, goes there from around the world. So, I think it's just people need to, I think with Australia, sometimes we get very pigeonholed in our thinking. We've got to always think globally um, and, you know, and some of the global issues and um, and start to, you know, go, actually, you know what? This is a challenge all around the world in, in fast growing populations where people want to live in certain pockets. Um, and it's not just a, a Sydney, Melbourne problem. Definitely a global issue. Uh, I think it's the the dilemma facing central banks and policymakers all around the developed world. And, 
uh, yeah, countries like Canada probably are the epitome of it. It's like, well, yes, you can keep on hiking interest rates to curb the housing market and to stop the buildup of private debt, but you take interest rates up too far too quickly, you are going to ultimately cause a recession, uh, which could be more painful um, on the way down. So I guess it's that uh, it's almost like a, a game of psychology and um, uh, home buyers are sort of uh, battling their wits against policy makers. I think um, one of the issues that I uh, noticed has uh, come up in the UK during my time here, I just saw a piece during the week saying that um, the total number of dwellings required over the past decade or so in the UK, three and a half million, and um, only 2.1 million have been built. So it's just a massive shortage building up. And particularly in the rental market, there's been a lot of measures to crack down um, on the benefits uh, accruing to private landlords, so um, tax deductibility of interest and so on. Uh, and I think the conclusion of the piece that I read was, well, you, you know, you can only build so much housing. And countries like the UK, Canada, and to some level, New Zealand, Australia, they're going to have to have a think about these levels of immigration because we just simply can't build at that rate. Um, and the UK, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, an accumulated shortage of housing. And Australia seems to be uh, grappling with the same kind of challenges on a lot of these levels. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting piece, and so thanks for sending it through. Um, so, yeah, what do you think there, Chris, I guess in terms of Australia? Uh, well, we've already touched, I guess, on the, the housing supply challenge. Uh, what are your um, clients saying to you about interest rates? Are they Presumably, they're mainly looking at variable rates now, and um, you know, people generally a bit more optimistic than they have been in the past month or two? Um, I do think there's a belief that um, they're not going to go up to sort of five or six percent. Um, you know, uh, some of my clients in investment banking, um, you know, they can sort of they have a different view because they're watching markets. Um, some clients are reading the news, right? I guess it comes down to a bit of context of where they're sort of getting the information and. Um, you know, whether they're naturally a bit more optimistic or pessimistic or whether a bit more of a bear or, um, you know, or a bull, I think so that all these things play into it. I would say, though, that ultimately people are cutting their spending back. I think everyone's a little bit very worried about their cash flow. I don't know about you, Pete, but when you're out spending money, I, I feel like everything's costing a lot of money. And people who have, you know, when money's really tight, there's going to be that trade-off. Do we really need that? Should we go for a cheaper option? Should we not go on holiday? Should we not go out for dinner? Should we just get some fish and chips at the beach, right? Like, so I think there's going to be this substitution um, and people are going to start to make as many cutbacks as they can because it's not a time to go and be frivolous and to, you know, go and spend money unless you're... Um, I do think that, that that's happening. So I reckon that whole monetary policy is working. But I would say that people aren't aggressively taking on mortgages. I do think there's a natural conservatism there. We see people actually, even though they've got a max budget, if they've got very strong incomes, they're wanting to buy within that. We're not going, not many clients are saying to us, oh, God, I really, really need more. Um, there are definitely those buyers. But I would say that, um, yeah, and I'd say that a lot of first-time buyers are absolutely back in the market. We're not seeing in Sydney a lot of upgraders in the market. I was chatting to a broker mate in Melbourne last week. He seems to think that, um, the upgraded market's still quite strong there. There's still quite a big appetite. I would say that's because the jump's not as big as it is in Sydney. But, um, yeah, it's definitely going to be a, a evolving story. But I would say people are making cutbacks. People are absolutely worried about um, their repayments. Multi-portfolio investors are really worried, even if they've got one or two properties. Um, and uh, But I would say that buyers are back. I, I would say I was really watching buyer perception the last two months. I was just wondering how those last couple of rate increases and the, the uncertainty around that was going to change people's attitudes to taking on mortgages. Do we really just delay our decision? Do we not buy at all? Do we take that sit on the fence approach? I would say that's not happening. Um, you know, we've got a huge list of pre-approvals, um, but everyone's sort of a bit nervous um, and they're all looking for, you know, very few properties on the market, all having a, a stock issue. So that would be my take. What about your team um, around the country, Pete? What are they sort of seeing? Yeah, so in Brisbane, uh, yeah, I mean, there's still not really, there's still a real shortage of stock. And um, just uh, intermittently, we're still seeing suburb records being paid for certain properties in certain suburbs. Um, very strong on the river front. So, so waterside properties, places like West End, South Brisbane, Hawthorne. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, we're getting plenty of inquiry. I think one, one thing we really did notice over the past three or four months is that people are inquiring, but they're just not starting their search. Every, a lot of people just sitting on the sidelines 
waiting patiently to see what happens with interest rates and are we getting closer to the peak? I think in terms of that, there's definitely signs now in the economy that discretionary uh, spending is coming down, um, just as you said, because as you go around the place, and I've been traveling overseas, everything's more expensive than it was. And that naturally, uh, you know, people just get a bit more cautious, especially if they've got a mortgage. Um, I think there was, there's been some good news. I mean, there's also over the past week, producer prices only up 0.5% over the quarter. So, I mean, that really portends lower inflation ahead. I think um, the interesting thing, Chris, as well, uh, just before we wrap up, is that we are now right in the eye of the storm for the fixed rate mortgage cliff. Now, I've been a believer all along that we'll get through this okay. I think partly for the reason that it's just been talked about so much and for so long um, that it's not it's not like it's an unknown risk. It's uh, something that everybody has been flagging, everyone's been talking about. But nevertheless, it is still flowing through, and it's um, people are seeing mortgages reset to higher rates. Um, I think um, it's certainly uh, leading some people to consider selling, uh, especially investment properties that are negative cash flow. Um, so this, this still has a, a little way to run for the rest of 2023. But at the moment, um, yeah, we're definitely right in the eye of the storm. But as you said, I think people will start to think about that bridge to the other side. Um, I think this week we'll see CoreLogic reporting home prices up about 1% again over the past month and a few positive headlines like that. And people will start to try and think across to the other side. But nevertheless, there's some pain still in the post from those fixed rate mortgages resetting, I think. Yeah, I think definitely people want to know um, how long rates are going to stay high. And so if that starts to get quite positive, that inflation really keeps dropping and that you know rate cuts are on the horizon, people will take a deep breath. Um, that's going to be, you know, in terms of prices, that would absolutely start pushing prices back up. Um, but people would knuckle down and on their mortgages and say, let's just get through this. We've just got to get through the next 12 months and things are going to get easier. I don't think people are there yet. So they're making cutbacks. So monetary policy is working. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the whole fixed rate cliffs, absolutely. Um, it was always going to be a bit of a process where there would be some issues for some people, but majority of people have made those adjustments. They've you know, they're not just waiting for that repayment to go up and go, oh, no, my repayment's gone up. They've been thinking about this for six, 12 months. They know it's happening. It's all over. They're not oblivious to the problem. Um, I think listing numbers are going to be so interesting in because uh, we're hitting August now, right? So they start to increase in August as it starts to get a bit nicer and warmer. In September and October, we're really increasing listings and then start to die off in November coming into Christmas, right? And so we've seen July's numbers, June, July numbers be quite high. We've not in the more affluent areas of our capital city, in the sort of more investor hotspots and um, the outer rings. And so let's track these listing numbers really closely, not on an aggregate level or a city level, but on a like an SA3, like a local area level. And then also in that area where what's selling? Is it apartments or is it houses? Like this is the detail you've got to go at. You know, you're going to get a lot of news articles over the next couple of months saying listings are going up and you know, everyone's rushing to sell. Well, where are they selling? And so we'll keep you up to date um, with that story each week because we'll be getting that data so we can, um, yeah, send it through to you. That is definitely an interesting story there because we, we were actually bidding on a, a unit or an apartment in Brisbane in uh, New Farm and uh, went in there with a pretty strong budget for one of our buyers and we were just blown out of the water. It probably went 10% over where we were expecting it to land. So, yeah, there's definitely um, some signs of that happening. And I guess with people uh, now having a lower borrowing capacity than a year ago and the really tight level of supply in Brisbane, it's pushing more people into townhouses and in some of the blue chip areas units. So we, for the first time in you know a decade or probably a dozen years, we're suddenly seeing unit prices rising in Brisbane and quite sharply in some cases. So interesting changes. And as you said, you need to get a bit granular you know there's a lot of media headlines about problems here and problems there but you need to understand the local market you're active in as always so, um, so just to wrap up on those three stories then so inflation figures finally easing by the looks of it for australia um definitely change in the yield curve this week um the terminal cash rate is not expected to be as high as people were thinking a week or two ago and uh, possibly starting to roll over secondly chinese developers exiting Australia in droves. Well, there's hardly any of them left. So uh, they've exited Australia in droves. And um, that just underscores the 
uh, supply issue that we've got in the housing market in Australia? Can we really build for 2.2 million population growth over the next five years? It's very questionable the way things are going. And there'll be a lot of hopes pinned on the build to rent sector. Uh, and thirdly, um, Canada's housing market still booming along despite higher mortgage rates against all expectations. So I think that uh, just mirrors some of the trends that we're seeing in other parts of the world, uh, that supply is not really keeping pace with uh, surging demand, despite all of those interest rate hikes and uh, certainly something we've seen a bit of in Australia over the past few months. So, uh, Chris, if people want to get in contact with you, any questions, uh, where should they go to for more? Yeah, jump onto the show notes, um, even though I'm away for just for a couple of weeks. So uh, I want to be probably doing this with Pete next week, and then I'll be back the following week. Um, we've got a big team here that are absolutely here to help if you want any help. So check it out in the show notes. And um, I'm always going to, even though I'm on holidays, Pete, I'm going to still read your blog. Um, won't be many things I'm reading. So, um, yeah, definitely if you haven't following Pete's blog, jump on there. Send Chris your questions. He'll uh, reply from the beach in Suva. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can catch me on my daily blog, Pete Wardrum Blogspot, or at Pete Wardrum on Twitter. And of course, always subscribe for the Rask podcast on your favorite podcast player. And final point of the week don't forget, if you haven't already, to get your tickets for the Rask Roadshow coming up very soon. Can't wait to get out there and mingle and meet some people. And as always, do send us your property questions via the link in the show notes. Uh, so that's it for this week. Thanks very much for. Uh, tuning in and thank you chris enjoy fiji and we shall see you in a week see you on the other side cheers happy sunday cheers, guys